Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Widener Show. If you like the Mike Widener Show and you want to make your own podcast, well, let me tell you about Anchor. First of all, it's free. Secondly, there's creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can also add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you. You can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, many more. You can also make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. So download the free Anchor app or go to Anchor FM to get start the mike wagner show is powered by sonic web studios hi this is me i'm Austin Zia, also known as me no time for love check out my latest book missing available in print and ebook format on amazon it's now time for the mike wagner show powered by sonic web studios and sponsored by international award-winning author mia mosin zia of missing the Mike Wagner Show can be heard on over 40 podcast platforms, as well as HamiltonRadio.net, Diamonds FM, and the TheMikeWagnerShow.com. We can be heard in over 100 countries, featuring over 1,000 well-known and amazing guests throughout the globe, and named one of the top 100 global podcasts in the New York Weekly Times, Hollywood Entertainment News, Los Angeles Weekly Times, Apple, and Chartable. So sit back and relax and enjoy another great episode of the award-winning Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show. Powered by SoundWeb Studios. Visit online at soundwebstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. That's 1-800-303-3960. Or email to support at soundwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Wagner Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Also, time to give an official shout-out to our official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author, Mia molson if you love fast-paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia. Available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast-paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries. Two strangers, one target. Where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia has garnered great reviews. In Eve 11 and George by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and Manilis. So grab your copy today for goes Missing by Mia Molson Zia. Available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com on over 40 podcast platforms heard in over 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Also, Anchor FM, iTunes, Google Play, Amazon, Audible, Apple Music. Also on Diamonds FM, Oldies Radio, and HamiltonRadio.net, plus a few other networks coming soon. Take the Mike Widener Show with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok today. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies, baseball gear. Makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson ZM for great books like Missing, Once, and Wrinkles. Also T-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson ZM. Check it out today. I'll support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and themikewidenershow.com. Make sure you give generously today. We're here with a terrific gentleman from Brooklyn. That is the amazing Mecca today out there. It's uh, He's um, a singer, rapper, dancer, producer, and a seven multi instrumentalist that's seven by the way just count them and uh george clinton's a 420 funk mob he performed with amy winehouse also in the 07 uh, mtv music awards that's where he got his um you know recognition he really got himself on the map he he also uh has a new uh new, new band called the planet 12 movement uh featuring the planet 12 uh syndrome as well sim seven time grammy nominated and also the grandson of a blues soul legend we'll talk about that and a brand new podcast featuring some amazing guests and he's also got a brand new song that's going to come out very soon and also can be hitting the tour trail as well live ladies and gentlemen from the plus studios in beautiful downtown brooklyn where all things are happening the multi-talented singer rapper dancer producer and seven multi instrumentalist performer ladies and gentlemen the amazing L-A-W. Hey, L-A-W, Mr. Wow. Law. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. And yes, thanks for joining us, by the way. Man, listen, thanks for having me here. That's one hell of an intro, man. I just got to say, 
I, I love what you're doing. I think that you're doing what a lot of other art, artists and podcasts should be doing, which is multimedia. You got your merch. So I, I'm giving flowers to you as well, brother. That's that's some excellent setup you got there, man. <laughs> Thank you. I love flowers. I gotta say that. I pass these on to my wife here. Here, honey. Mwah. <laughs> and that's the reason why y'all still married. That's a smart, smart man. <laughs> that's right. I, I mean, it's been a long time. I gotta say that you gotta love each other. So that'll be another Absolutely. time as well. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, there are great examples out here with, with the way marriage and stuff is set up now. It's good to hear stories like like yours and a lot of other my other friends who have been married for so long or even just pushing through everything so that's that's amazing to hear man mm -hmm. and thank you very much as well too that'll be on another subject but you're a singer rapper dancer producer and a multi instrumentalist which is seven by the way and a very lucky number for you and you also been in mm -hmm. george clinton's um 420 funk mob uh, you perform with amy winehouse at the old seven mtv music awards and you also have a new band called the planet 12 movement and you're the grandson of a blues soul legend um sam the blues man taylor and uh, you have a new podcast which is called the planet 12 we'll talk about that along with uh, um, your previous releases, uh, She Can Get It with Jelly Bean Johnson, and you have an EP called Megadote Maniac, and you have a brand new song before you hit a tour, which is America's Inception. And before getting to all that um, amazing uh, career, LAW, tell us how you first got started. Oh, uh, man. Well, um, I, of course, I will give you the shortest version possible. Um, I come from a family of musicians, you know, my family's known in the industry on both sides. Um, you know, my full name is Lawrence Taylor Worrell. So Taylor is my grandfather's side and Worrell is my father's side. So both names ring prominent in the music industry on so many different levels. Um, of course, starting with my legendary, um, blues, rock and roll, doo-wop, um, blues hall of famer, granddad, Sam Bluesman Taylor. And on the other side of the fence, um, with the Warrells, of course, um, Bernie Warrell of Apartment Funkadelic. So there's been a lot of um, in between stuff in terms of my family being my Juilliard for music. You know, most people go to school for for music, but my family was my Juilliard because everybody had a section. My mother, Sandra Taylor, still tours the world with her Motown review and tribute to all the girl groups. Um, Sandra Taylor, first place winner at the Apollo Theater. Um, my late my, my late incredible uncle, um, Bobby Real Deal Taylor in heaven. He was a 13 time Apollo theater winner as well. So, um, I, I was, I was born into it. That's the only way to really kind of subjugate it in, in terms of, um, you know, being raised in a family full of artists and musicians. So it wasn't forced into me. It wasn't, it was just something that if it's a part of your heritage, you naturally gravitate towards it. If I wasn't doing music, um, I would be boxing, which is also the family sport oh, as wow. well. Because um, yeah, me, my, my grandfather actually, um, his trainer was Papa Fly, who was Joe Lewis's trainer. So I, I come from a lineage of boxing, um, football, um, baseball, and definitely um, on the lawyer side of things. I actually started to be a paralegal when I went to Kingsborough College. So that could have easily been any one of those things, especially for media journalism. But the music bug just overrode everything no matter what no matter what else i got into it always seemed to lead back to me picking up a guitar or or singing or rapping or, or dancing it always just led back to the music so i just knew i'm like you know what let's move forward in this and, and see where it goes from there so i mean that's basically how i got started three years old i was already kind of um singing more than i was talking so um by the time i turned five um started playing drums so like any other kid, you beat up on stuff and then you have a natural <laughs> rhythm. I come, I, I come from a family of drummers. My legendary uncle, um, Tony T. Funk Austin, played with James Brown and Cool in the Gang. So, oh, my um, gosh. And then my other uncle, um, Rudy Worrell, was also playing with um, Blue Magic, um, Millie Jackson, and a lot of the, the, North, the, Northern, the, the Northern soul artists that were coming out during the 70s. So drums became the first thing. And then two of my cousins, Rudy and Rasheen, they're the sons of Rudy Worrell. So even though I was good, they were way better. So my thing is like, <laughs> I'm be playing drums, but they have a natural habitat like my uncle. So you know what? I'm going to come over here talk. Because my granddad, of course, you know, Sam Blues Mantel, that's my first guitar influence. And then after that, I discovered Hendrix because my grandfather actually gave Jimi Hendrix his first job when he left. Wow, yeah. Amazing. <laughs> Before the, before the Jimi Hendrix that we all knew with the crazy hair and the, the Jimi Hendrix that the image that we're known as today, a lot of people forget that Jimi paid his dues as a rhythm guitarist playing with the Ozzy Brothers, Little Richard, 
um, Curtis Knight. So it, my grandfather was in that gene pool with everybody else. So um, when my granddad left Joy D and the Starlight, as you remember the Peppermint Twist back in the 60s, he did a real guitar for that band. When my grandfather left, he was like, look, I want to do more writing and producing, but I got just the guy to take my place. And he went to the village and got Jimmy. And Jimmy actually got with um with Jordy and the Starlighters and stayed there for a short stint. And then of course, if you know the story, Cass Candler saw him at the um at, at the um Cafe Wa in the village and took him back to London. And and the rest is history. So um again, long story short, this is my life. So when we go when you grow up having Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys come to your house in California and you walk in from school and Benny King and Albert Collins is sitting right there in your living room, you know, I that, that's how I really knew that my grandfather was was the truth. So I, I learned very early in the game in terms of doing that. So it helped me to develop what I was into and everything like that. So yeah, that is so interesting. You know, your um your your grandfather, you know, actually taking in Jimi Hendrix under the wing, and um I guess I kind of wonder about Jimi Hendrix, you know, being like easy to work with and everything like that. Oh, do, yeah. do you think it was more of a student that was willing to really suck it all in or something like that? Well, I mean. Let's keep it honest. I mean, listen, as my grandfather once said, we all get something from somebody. Nobody comes into, I mean, of course, there are natural gifts. I mean, look at somebody, a perfect example. I, I just spent time a couple of months ago. I had a pleasure of meeting my number two idol next to Prince, which is Stevie Wonder. I hung out with Stevie Wonder for five hours. In oh, a my restaurant. gosh. So keep in mind, yeah, you can, you can imagine what my, I cried and everything. It was emotional for me. But here's the thing. As gifted as Stevie Wonder, as we all know he is, Stevie was soaking up everybody that he was around at Motown. If you read all the stories about Stevie Wonder, all the people that, that worked at Motown, whether it's the a rs the musicians, the Funk Brothers, all the musicians, they all said Stevie Wonder, as, as confident as he could be, even though he was great at what he was naturally as a kid, he took everything in. So that was me, basically. And then think about it. Definitely Jimmy, because as bad as Jimmy was. Jimmy, and it's funny, because that's why Little Richard always make the joke. He said, I had to fire, you know how you talk, I had to fire Jimmy, because, you know, Jimmy tried to upstage me. Because it, wasn't <laughs> to, it, wasn't that, it wasn't that Jimmy was trying to upstage him. It was more so because, you know, very much like Michael Jackson, and I'm a fan of all six Jackson brothers, because Jermaine is the reason why I play bass, but as everybody knows, you know, Michael just had this special thing about him. It doesn't mean that all the brothers are not talented. All the brothers are deadly in their own section. But Michael was just a whole nother animal. There were a lot of great guitar players when Jimi Hendrix was starting. But as everybody knows, there was just something just extra special about his technique. And mind you, I mean, you know, remember, he couldn't read music, couldn't read or write music. But the technical part of who he was was an extension of his instrument. So I'm pretty sure him hanging around my grandfather and and being around, you know, the Isleys and and Curtis Knight and all the other blues guys, you know, he hung out with Ike Turner as well. So my thing is that I'm pretty sure Jimi Hendrix definitely soaked up the game. I mean, my, first of all, he ain't the first dude to play behind his back. That's that's T Bone Walker, who my grandfather. <laughs> Walker I, I figure if somebody like that, yeah, Jimmy yeah. wasn't always the first. You know, Jimmy was never the first to play his guitar and fire, play a Star Spangled Banner. Some someone always did it before him. So I mean, you got, I mean, like the great Nas said. You know, one of my favorite MCs of all time. Nas says no idea is original, and I understood what he meant because there's there's ideas that are original, but what happens is that. There's somebody that's done it a way different before. Somebody could take certain elements and put certain things in the pot. And some people can say, okay, this has never been done before. So usually when somebody says never been done before, I'm like, I'm 90% willing to believe it never been done before. But there's always that 10% that may be like, you know what? There's an origin there somewhere. You understand what I'm saying? And that's why mm -hmm. I always tell people very quickly, you know, music is universal. It's for everybody, no matter which gender, race, color, creed, or whatever. But we're not going to pretend that American music is not black derivative. It is what it is. As, as the late, great Ray Manzarek from The Doors, one of my favorite bands, said in an interview, he said, listen, if it wasn't for, if it wasn't for, for black artistry and, and them creating it, us white guys would still be playing the Molly Third. That's his works. So mm. he knew. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with Carlos Santana, who lets people know. All this Latin stuff you hear, this is African rhythm. This is what it is. This is where it all stems from. And then everything else create its own lane. So do you have people who are innovators that came up with different techniques and different ways of doing things in certain genres of music? Because that's how genres were created. So 
again, there's always an origin. And then every now and then you have somebody that came with something that was totally different that nobody did. No, those are rare guys. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking about in terms of guitars as well, too. You can also go back to blues as well. You know, Muddy Waters is another, if you all know, way go back, really start the whole thing. Robert Johnson. It's like, you know, oh, wow. everybody yeah. talks about Robert Johnson. I mean, oh my goodness. Yeah. I mean, oh, yes. Yeah. Holy whole new level right there. Yeah, because Robert was doing something in that department that wasn't being done. I mean, here's, a, here's an even funny story. One of my grandfather's very good friends, the late, great B.B. King. How do you BB like King, that? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I had the pleasure of hanging out of hanging out with Uncle B.B. So for me, it's personal when, when I talk about B.B. What my grandfather used to always say, this is his voice. He used to be like, um, he said, um, listen, he said, I love B.B., but, you know, B.B. used to piss me off because he didn't play chords. <laughs> no, because because BB King wasn't a chord player. BB King was the master of bending the string to perfection, and that's what. Why you think that he's every? A lot of the rock and roll guitar guys, especially overseas in London, they worship BB King because BB King didn't play chords, but the way he like that whole a thrill is gone. You hear that? That's BB style, and then you got somebody like Albert King, who was more my favorite. That's Stevie Ray Vaughan's idol. How do you because, like that? Because, because well, Stevie, well, that's a whole other topic to begin with. Stevie Ray Vaughan is the truth, period. But the thing is that Stevie Ray's another one. He was a diehard Albert Collins and Albert King fan, but you can hear the Hendrix influence in his stuff, too. So for the modern-day guitar players that were coming up in my era, like in the 80s, Stevie Ray Vaughan was definitely, like, in the top five. Absolutely, without question. So, oh yeah. my gosh, that is so amazing. In fact, I talked to some of the um, you know, blues guitarists uh, on the other side of the pond, and a lot of the people from Europe, you know, actually do take up uh BB King, and then you yes. got um you, you know uh from here just take up um you know, like say with Hendrix uh, on the other side, and you you touched on it, and I thought this whole thing really makes sense, how everything just comes together. Yeah, everything ha everything like 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 the late like like, like the incredible Q tip from Trial Core Quest says. I like to quote people because a lot of times you can only understand a quote if you don't want to get a whole soliloquy, which we try to avoid in interviews to shorten everything. But um, Q-Tip from Trial Core Quest says everything comes in cycle. He said that when he used to listen to hip hop, when his father would come and listen to him, you know, listen to all this different hip hop that we grew up on. His father said these guys remind me of the, a lot of the jazz bebop artists, which made a lot of sense why Q-Tip's Trial Core Quest sound was heavily jazz based, even though it was definitely hardcore hip hop, but there was a lot of elements to it and jazz being a forefront element. So when hip hop began to get more progressive in the nineties, they borrowed from all these, they save a borrow sample, whatever you want to call it, stole, whatever. They took what they could and they improvised on it and added their own fixtures. Mm. So, so it's kind yeah. of taking it a whole new level instead of like, you know, ripping it off, they took a sample and take it a whole new level. Mm. And that That's becomes that. That, be, that becomes the, the world the world over to be in a way where people who really don't understand the the leverage of how these things come together, because, again, music is universal. So even through the black experience, everybody picked up on. That's why I'm, I often have to correct people. I'm like, look, every white artist is not a culture appropriator. There are some who are, but there are many white artists who have given the credit, who, have, who knows where it comes from, who has done the homework and let it be known. This is where I get my shit from. So it's almost like a thing as to where um, a lot of times you have to, the lines get blurred because certain things get put into play. I had to school people about Elvis on so many different levels. A lot of people had this image of him, of him being a racist. My grandfather worked with Elvis. So this is how I know that he wasn't a racist. My grandfather wouldn't lie to me or make up a thing to protect his honor because all the guys that worked with Elvis, all the doo -wop guys that hung with him, you know, even Jackie Wilson's son, Bobby Wilson told the whole, the same story I told. I'm like, see, so I, I'm not lost because that Jackie Wilson was Elvis's hero. So ah, people that's but people, but people don't know because again, we were taught, we, we didn't have social media back then. That's why I say thank God for social media because you get to hear and you get to hear the real stories and the real information from the people who were there or the people that told the people who were there Remember, my grandfather's been been dead for over what 12, 13 years now, not more. Mm -hmm. So my thing is that I toured with my grandfather. I hung around him and Benny King when they were telling me these stories about um Elvis and um Jerry Lee Lewis and all these other guys 
who were in the mix way before I was way before my mother was born. So I'm I'm going I'm going to listen to the OGs as we say, you know, shut your mouth when the OGs are talking. So every time I got around the OGs, I, I didn't say nothing. I just I, I had questions, of course. I'm always going to ask questions, but um, I sat there and I soaked up the game. Period. Mm, that's rather interesting too. You mentioned about working with a legend and another legend you were with, uh, George Clinton. We'll talk about that in just one minute. But first, listen yeah. to the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com, powered by SoundCloud Studios. Visit online at soundcloudstudios.com for all your needs. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. SoundCloud Studios is the answer. SoundCloud Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs at below the competition way. Call today, 1 800 303 3960. That's 1 800 303 3960. Or email to support at soundcloudstudios.com. Mention to Mike Widener show, get 20% off your first project. Soundcloud Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give official shout out to our official sponsor, the Mike Widener show, International War Ring author, Mia Molson Zia. If you love fast paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast-paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. It takes place in four countries, two strangers, one target, where truth is illusion and those you love will be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon in paperback and ebook. Missing by Mia Molson Zia's Garn Great Reviews. And Eve 11 endorsed by Howard celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Riley, and Manils. So grab your copy today for Goes Missing by Mia Molson Zia, available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com on over 40 podcast platforms heard in 100 countries, including HamiltonRadio.net, Diamonds FM, Oldies Radio, and more. Take us with you on any mobile device. Subscribe to the Mike Widener Show on the YouTube channel. Follow the Mike Widener Show on Instagram and Twitter. Twitter and TikTok today for great gift ideas. Go to Amazon.com and check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books, merchandise, and more. I'll support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and the Mike Widener Show.com. Make sure you do so today. We're here with the multi talented singer, rapper, dancer, producer, and seven multi instrumentalist Planet 12, best known as the LAW here on the Mike Wagner yeah. Show, and just amazing as well, too. Planet 12 is part of your project. And one of the, um, you, you uh, mentioned a bunch of legends you were involved with. You also played with George Clinton and also the uh, 420 Funk Mob. And uh, tell us more about that. What was it like playing with George Clinton? One of my favorites. Well, I mean, I'm a tw- I'm twenty I'm twenty plus years in as a as a certified P Fund member. I still play with them. As a matter of fact, um, we have a show coming up at the legendary Whiskey A Go Go next week, four twenty Funk Mile, and I think it's going to be the official after party for um the Palmer Funkadelic show, if I'm not mistaken. But um, um, off and on, of course, not as consistent as we did when I first joined the camp. But of course, you know, P Funk is like a big ass tree with a bunch of branches on it and we're all the, the subsidiary acts like Bootsy, you know, Uncle Bernie and um, Parlette, um, the Brides of Funk. And so, you know, there's like a bunch of trees. So all of us that created our own chapters within the P-Funk environment, um, we lay claim to that. So to say, I, I still I still get chills when I perform with that. I, I call George dad because, you know, George was the first one that gave me my first major industry check. I was making, I was making some money doing shows and stuff, but George valued me as a producer. He saw what the record labels weren't seeing in me because we were having such a difficult time trying to get signed and different things like that. And then it's interesting because at 12 years old, I told my mother, one day I'm going to meet George Clinton. I'm going to become a part of P-Funk Arms. This is me at 12 years old. When I discovered his mother, (laughs) I mean, because you got to keep in mind, I'm an 80s baby. So for me, as hip hop started to come into the picture, but then... There's my uncle, a legendary funk drummer that had the greatest funk collection of all time. Um, as a matter of fact, not even just funk. Um, uncle Tony also had jazz fusion records like Mahavishnu Orchestra, Weather Report, Miles Davis, Herbie Hancock. So, And as we know, jazz fusion, for the most part, in the 70s, there was always a certain level of funk. So mm-hmm. just to show you how influential... Um, Palm and Funkadelic is and how, you know, even with the rock and roll, because Funkadelic is without question the first heavy metal rock band there was before mm. anybody. So that's the bottom line. And not just the first heavy metal band, but the first heavy metal black band. Because as you notice, there would be no Living Color, there would be no Living Kravitz, no Bad Brains, no Fishbone, no Prince, if it wasn't for Palm and Funkadelic. Because he also they mentioned, were the first ones to get, yeah. And he also mentioned Living Color as well, too. They're one of my favorites uh, back in the day, although they had a couple of albums. It's like they made a big impact out there, I'll tell you. Because, because and, and mind you, because, I mean, Vernon, Vernon Reed will tell you, and, and same thing with, the, with Corey Glover, they'll tell you, they're not the first black band of that caliber because Fishbone was out before them. But Living Color's mainstream success made them important. 
because they were able to break through certain grounds that a lot of the other hardcore underground black bands like Bad Brains and Fishbone weren't able to. And it's crazy because Fishbone was in the mainstream. They were on MTV and all that. But for some reason, I don't know. And I, and I blame the record labels. I don't really blame the fan base because you see their fan base is still worldwide and everything else. But um, Living Color just was able to break through and call, call it personality. Once that record came out and it went platinum, now they were able to see that, okay, we're reminding y'all guys, rock and roll is for everybody, but us black folks, don't forget, we started this. Just making sure, you know, because it was very taboo, like, we haven't seen a black rock band before. I said, because you clearly haven't been doing your homework the last 20, 30 years. <laughs> That's not, true, they're not, yeah. They're not, they're not the first. I mean, and, but, but again, see, me and you, we know, like the real music lovers and the real historians that are, that are my fan base, they know. And, if, and the ones that don't know, they get an education like what we're doing right now. They get educated. So it's almost like a thing as to where you have to understand that there was a time, once the influx of a lot of the white rock and roll bands came into the mix, some people forget. It got to a point where even some of my people were referring to rock and roll as white people's music. I'm like, uh, hell no, it isn't. Y'all got, y'all going to get screwed. And mind you, Metallica is my favorite heavy metal band. So that eliminates that whole thing about white and black because I love Poison, I love Megadeth, I love all those guys. I said, but the whole truth of the matter is that, like we said earlier, there is an origin. So you mm. got to remember. And if we talk about, if we talk about anything regarding heavy metal or heavy sounds and things of that nature. I mean, look at George Clinton back in the day. He was the first one to have a mohawk in 68. Nobody had a hairstyle like George Clinton. I, I, I remember seeing something like that, you know, on yeah. those Parliament albums. And Nobody had that. Haircut. That. Yes, yeah. And it's oh funny because yeah, he, he had design. Now, let me show you how infantry is in hip-hop. In the 90s and the 80s, as you know, if you know anything about hip-hop culture, um, I had a flat top back in the day. I, I had a bunch of hair. So before I grew the Afro thing out trying to be like Redman, I literally had a flat top. So, of course, back in the day, designs in the back of your head for a hip hop thing was the popular thing. Now, mind you, in my generation, we think like, yeah, we're doing something new. Our parents never did nothing like this before. And then here comes George Clinton. George Clinton had his barber cut moons and stars in his head back in 1967. Wow. Before hip hop was even thought about. Mm -hmm. So what does that tell you? There is an origin. You think you're doing something new and then you find out. Mm, it ain't really that new. Same thing with Kid and Play. You know, we used to always like, do that Kid and Play dance move. Yeah. And then my mother be like, hey, nothing but the Charleston. I'm like, okay, here come the old folks. And then that's me being done. I'm like, here come the old folks. And then the thing is that one day in my class, I took a jazz class. One day in my class, we talking about the whole culture, not the music. We talking about the culture first. Say, so, yeah, you know, the dancing, like the, um, the Charleston. And when I saw them do the same move that Kid and Play was doing, I said... It makes a lot of sense. And Kid and Play have always noted, just so we clear, they've always said, like, like, how did that step come about? He said, well, basically, the Kid and Play kick step is just an advanced version of, of the old step called the Charleston. He said, the only difference between the Charleston and us is that me and, me and Play, we kick our feet together. And the Charleston was more of a repeated leg move that went back and forth. And then in hip hop, you see that often. So my thing is just that, again, everything has an origin. So going back to George Clinton, George Clinton and Parliament Funkadelic did a lot of things first before many of the rock bands and are definitely the funk bands. Because if you have to if you have to categorize funk in a trilogy, here's the breakdown of it all. James Brown created the funk. Sly and the Family Stone diversified the funk. But George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic, they made funk world wide religion. Funk became a genre because of George. Mm. Without question. And that is certainly an amazing trilogy as well, too. And you also had uh, performed with a legend, uh, a late legend, Amy Winehouse, at the 07 um, MTV Music Awards. And that had to be almost like a big breakthrough for you. You had a lot of great reviews. What was it like of performing with Amy Winehouse? Oh, uh, man, I, I, I get emotional when I talk about my little sister. You know, rest in peace in heaven. Because Amy was in my humble opinion and I'm, and I'm not being biased i'm just being real because you know at that when i started working with amy i was at a point in my career where i was very choosy about who i worked with some people may call it cocky and it's not cocky i'm like no once you have a reputation and name you can't just sing back up behind anybody or people that were willing to, to sing behind anybody for money i'm not that guy like if i'm not a fan of that artist or if i'm not really digging 
what they're doing. I'm not going to pretend and be like, oh, well, I said, no, I can make money elsewhere. And that's mm-hmm. the way I had it. At that particular point, when I met Amy, I was really at a point where I was very choosy about who I sang backup for. So when I got to know her music before I made the decision to actually take the job, I was blown away because she, here, here's this 24, 23, she had to be 23, 24 at the time, pint size, small, petite girl with a Ronnie Spector hair. That's what got me. I'm like, I said, she's done her homework. I, I noticed the beehive hairdo right away. I said, she's done her homework. So there's the inflections of jazz. There's the blues. And then she loves hip hop. And then she took a whole, she took a whole Motown song. Tears dry on their own is nothing but ain't no mountain high enough. Wow. And she put her own thing on top of it, which I thought was clever. Because, you know, usually um, most people that that sample a Motown or any type of old school record, they always give like a, a, a shout out to the chorus. This girl took the whole music of Astrid and Simpson, who wrote Ain't No Mountain High Enough for Marvin Gaye and Tammy Terrell, Tammy Terrell and put her own vibe on it. Man. I respected that because you know usually when you do a cover or you try to take somebody's stuff, it's like, okay, come on. And she knew. The thing about Amy is that she knew what she was doing. So it wasn't like this thing as to where, um, well, we don't know who those people are. Amy was, I want people to, well, what I want people to know about Amy is that Amy was a show enough student of her craft. That's what made me love it. The conversations that me and her had. When we had dinner and breakfast and things like that, she knew about my granddad. That blew my mom. She did a homework on me. So my thing is that um, it, it, it just, you know, I miss her so much because I felt like if she would have been more ambitious, because she was she really wasn't ambitious. Like she really, she recorded so much stuff that you're only going to get like a couple of more albums from her for Universal because she didn't really record a lot of stuff out there, um, the albums that they put out with Tony Bennett and all that other stuff that they've been releasing because... I used to tell all the time, I'm like, you don't realize what you've done in this game, you know, coming in here. You know, you, Lady Gaga as well. Like, everybody that came in with their own chapters from that side of the fence, you know, Gaga's, I mean, Gaga's from here, but, um, you know, Adele is from overseas, overseas as well. So, um, yeah, working with Amy was just was just incredible. Like, she, even when she was tipsy or halfway drunk, she would come and do sound check, and it would be flawless more than people who I've worked with that have a professional setting that didn't drink or do any of that stuff. So, um, yeah, and, and I miss her so much. I, I really do. We, we, In that short matter of time, we really made a lot of impact. The fans all over the world still keep in touch with me and, and, and my, my partner, Zylon, who's, you know, who's an original Amy, back, original Amy Winehouse background singer. And, um, you know, it's just, it's incredible. People still do the moves that we created, which is very fun because, you know, we were able to have a lot of freedom on stage as her background singers, you know, we were doing steps that people liked, kind of like the pips, the temptations, you know, that sort of thing, you know. That is so amazing. And when, when I heard first of all, Amy Winehouse, and they said they had comparisons to uh, Billie Holiday, and I thought, this is going to be like the next best big thing. And I said, oh my gosh, amazing. Did the uh, beehive, it's like, it just brought, it just brought back the beehive being cool again. I loved it. <laughs> well, I mean, because, I mean, I, I, I mean, again, you know, Sometimes you have to borrow. Sometimes you have to look to inspiration. There's certain things that I've done that fans who've been paying attention to me long enough, or they read my posts, whether they're long or short, <laughs> they get the whole advantage of, oh, I see where you got that from. Like people, fans will run up on me like that one riff you did, that sound like Shaka Khan. I said, well, Shaka Khan's my favorite female singer of all time. So the fact that you heard it in my voice, that means you've been paying attention. So it's, you know, it's everything. That's the, the thing I've always done because George did it as well. You know, we take everything that we love and we put it in a pot, you know, and because I'm an 80s, 90s kid. So it's like all this stuff that came from the era before me because of my family, there's still a big pot of a lot of stuff that we can add into it to make it even more eventful. Because a lot of times, I'm gonna be, the reason why I have to always say 80s and 90s, baby, because there was a certain period of time where a lot of the guys were hating on my era. And I'm like, no, 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 you're not going to hate on my era. I said, listen, I love the 50s. I'm not, I wasn't even born in the 50s. I was born in the, in the late 70s. I'm like, 50s, I love all that music. So here comes my era. We have something to offer. We definitely helped change generation because video killed the radio star. That's there true, you know? yes. So my thing is that, give us, no, put some respect on our era. That was my main thing. It wasn't about, I, see, I wasn't one of those kids that was like, Man, that's that that's that old school shit. Like, see, a lot of kids try to do that now, like these millennials. And then here's the thing. They say that, 
But then every record I've heard in the last five years, they always take it from Michael Jackson, from Prince, from even even from Fer this one guy. Who's this guy? Jack Harlow, do white rapper. He took um Fergie's Fergie's hit. Fergie's hit is not even ten years old, if I'm not mistaken. I'm glamorous like. Oh so yes, that's favorite. right. Jack Harlow. I think he was out of uh, Kentucky. That was the big deal yeah. there. So it's like, you know, you usually get the uh, people from New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, Miami, Dallas, but Kentucky of all places. Because you know, no matter how because no matter how new school these guys think that they're doing something new, they always find themselves having to go back because all those guys don't understand the gift of songwriting. I'm not I'm not knocking them. I'm just making a point. I'm making a point to say that you always have to be respectful of the shit that came before you. Mm -hmm. So the thing with me is that I wasn't that kid. Like a lot of, I'm from the era where it wasn't cool to hang out with your parents. I did shows and I still do shows with my mother from time to time. I do shows with her. So my thing is that my parents and my grandparents were cool as fuck. So for me, I never subscribed to that typical 80s, 80s, 90s theory. My parents were cool. I had more freedom in my house than most of my own cousins did. So there you go. So mm -hmm. I, I had to, I, I got the coolest mom in the world. So, yeah. Uh, and, and we're certainly glad you do so. You also worked with another legend as well, too. You've got an EP. We'll talk about your latest release and upcoming tour, podcasts, and more. You listen to the Mike Widener Show at themikewidenershow.com, powered by SoundCloud Studios. Visit online at soundcloudstudios.com for all your needs. Also brought to you by our official sponsor, the Mike Widener Show, international warring author, Mia Mosesia Missing, available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. We'll be back with the multi talented LAW. After this time, the Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1 800 303 3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention the Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter, and it's very well done. I'm gonna highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I wanna give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamotionzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers, and boy, are you in luck. Right place, right time. Tuned in to The Mike Wagner Show. You heard me. We're back with the amazingly multi-talented LAW and the Plant 12 Project here on the Mike Wagner Show. And uh, we talked about um, a lot of the amazing backgrounds of people you worked with, a lot of influences. And you also worked with another legend as well, too, with uh, Jilly Bean Johnson, accompanied by Tony Moe and Monty Moore. She can get it. And also your uh, EP, Mega Adult Maniac. And uh, tell us more about that. And what was it like working with Jelly Bean Johnson? Well, I mean, you know, Uncle Jelly Bean... Uncle Monty Moore. I mean, for anybody that knows about the Minneapolis sound, of course, spearheaded by my number one idol in heaven, Prince. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, major, you know, and I always say number one because when people, you know, people are curious, like, like, why is he you know, like, why is he number one? Because even though Michael Jackson is my first primary hero, like for any other for any for any black or white kid that grew up in the 80s, Michael was pretty much the temple. Like, that's where we want to be. He, he creates magic. But the more I got into Prince, the more I understood who I was because Prince can play extreme guitar solos and every other instrument, but then he can put the instruments down and can perform and give you image, he can give you sex, he can give you um, political shit, he can give you, you know, just straight up fun and, and just combining all these genres together, very much like his number one idol, which is Stevie Wonder. So, of course, even though Prince spearheaded the Minneapolis sound, he didn't do it alone. So the architects, Mars Day and the Time, which of course Jelly Bean and Monty Moore are known for, and of course um, Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, who changed the game as R and B pop producers. Oh, definitely, yes. You know the influence that the Minneapolis 
sound had on the musical culture from the 80s going all the way up until now, it was only right. So um, with the group Enema Squad, which is another p funk band, um, um, courtesy of my boy Gabe Gonzalez, we were the time's opening act. So for me, meeting my time heroes was even bigger than anything else because Jelly Bean being one of the greatest, if not top five, most influential funk drummers of all time, without question, but also a beastly guitar player, also a beastly producer. Same thing with Monty Moore, because, you know, they produce Black Cat and, um, and um, The Pleasure Principle for Janet Jackson. So we've been friends for over 20 years. So our friendship is what led to that collaboration because everybody always wondered, are y'all guys going to ever work on something together? I said, yeah, when the time is right. And it wasn't because of nothing that they did or something that we didn't do because you got to remember, I'm forging my own destiny with Planet 12 and Mars in the time will forever be booked in this business until, until they until they decide to stop doing it. So we were busy, but we always kept in touch. We, we came to each other's shows. One night, one special night, I played the bitter end Jelly Bean sat in with us and Sinbad as well. Like they all sat in with us and and that was a major thing. So She Can Get It came about one day because Jelly Bean decided that he wanted to start working on an album. He never did an album before. Now he's not a singer, but of course, you know, he's like 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 like, like a Santana thing, you know, mm -hmm. playing guitar solos over some dope groups with some dope producers and writers. So imagine my surprise when I got the call. I was shocked. Because, you know, again, we're friends. And like, that's, that's, like, that's my uncle. I call him my uncle. We're family. He said, yo, nephew, I've always loved your production. I always loved you. You know, he's been following my career. He loved my, my first two albums. He said, man, you got, you got, I'm working, I'm working on the album, man. You got something for me? I'm like, something for you? <laughs> You're the reason why me and my boys became producers and writers. You, Jimmy, and Terry, and Monty. So my thing is like, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm like, <sighs> Oh, I know the feeling. Yes. Yeah, so, I, so I, I'm just like I, I'm. I'm humble, of course. I'm like, wow, Lord, that means you've really been doing something right. Because for Jelly Bean or any, see, here's the thing. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get back to the story, but any hero of mine that shows me love or gives me any flowers, I've done my job. I, I mean, God forbid if I never get a platinum or gold plaque. That's not. That's not what it's about. I mean, that's great, but if I never get a Grammy, that's great too. But those are my rewards and awards. Anytime that any one of my heroes talk about my singing, my rapping, my musicianship, my dancing, no matter what aspect of my talent, I know I'm doing something right because I don't pay people to co-sign my work. I didn't I didn't tell Lionel Richie to mention me in an interview. He mentioned me in an interview. I'm like, wow. And that's one of my closest friends. Like, I didn't ask Lionel to do that. That's because when the talent is real and it speaks people will will tell you in a matter of heartbeat. And I promise you, if I would have been just quiet and weak and extra humble, I probably wouldn't have gotten those accolades because you have to prove yourself. But um, going back to Jelly Bean, um, it felt good. So I said, I sent them this tracks. So I had this one groove that I was working on, which was crazy. Matter of fact, hold it right there. I'm actually, I'm gonna actually play a little bit for you just to show you oh, how oh. this shit. Oh, feel free. Yes, definitely feel free. You can do so on the Mike Wagner show as well, too. So we're here with the amazing uh, LAW here on the Mike Wagner show. And um, looks you're like you play you're your guitar. You're so. going to get a treat. Absolutely. So the thing was, is that I had this song that I was going to put for my third album, which eventually became Mega Domain. Because I was, I was very slow working on it because at that time I was putting stuff together and then bam, the pandemic happens. That's another story. But um, the thing was, I already had this groove, so it was just a typical, you know, nine on the eleven, you know, C sharp, C, C sharp sort of thing. That's all I had. So I didn't have no words yet. Now, mind you, this wasn't meant for Jelly Bean at first; it was just meant for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't even have the title at that particular time. All I had was just that. That's all I had. So I said to myself, now this is me not talking to Jelly Bean yet. So he's like, yo, he said, I, I, can you get it to me in a, in a few days? I'm like, yeah, I got you. So I go to the studio <laughs> and I come back to that riff again. Now I'm sitting here struggling. I'm like, do I keep this for myself or do I give it to Uncle B? Because mm -hmm. keep in mind, Jelly Bean was doing a lot of blues stuff at this time. Because you got to remember, 
that was his escapism for him to play more rock and roll and more progressive guitar because you know when he went to time it's all about Minneapolis it's all about that 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 same type of obrium synth synthesizers like the the, the Prince sound so basically right. I felt like for him he wouldn't want to put that that Minneapolis stuff on his album because he's been doing that for over 40, 50 something years. So it's like, we want to do something different. So I was scared. I was scared to give it to him. I'm like, he might reject it. Be like, say, ah, you know, Lord, nephew, I love it, but I'm trying to do some more progressive stuff, which, which, which I would have gave him too. But I'm just saying more so. I thought in my mind that if Jelly Bean does his first album, all the fans that know who Jelly Bean Johnson is, they're going to want to hear a song that's more in line with what they mostly know him for. Because no matter what Jelly Bean does progressively, at the end of the day, he is primarily and mostly known as one of the greatest funk drummers of all time playing behind Mars St. Tom. He's still there with the press camp. So people know that. And as well as his production for Black Cat with Janet Jackson and New Edition and a lot of other artists as well. So I said, you know what? I'm just going to go all balls out. So next thing you know, I'm playing this. That's the bass line. Wow. Because the bass line is basically doing what, what the guitar part is doing. So I just started playing it. She can get it. Now, she can get it is a popular phrase, as you pretty much know. That's pretty much another way of saying... A girl that looks good, if I ever had a shot with her, she could definitely get some of this loving. So um, there were a lot of other songs that even had the same title I didn't even know about till later on. So I'm just like, me and my boy Errol used to always say that when we were at the club. You know, we wasn't trying to pursue too much. And we looking like, yeah, she can get it. And I was like, this would be a, this would be a nice song. It's mm -hmm. sexy. And then I thought about the Minneapolis sound. So it became, musically, it became my love letter to Minneapolis. But lyrically, it is what it is. We're talking about girl watching, basically. It's sexy. So the thing is that the Minneapolis sound, to me, why, why is it important to music culture? For two reasons. It was sexy enough for the ladies to shake their ass. This is why Prince and Mars had a huge female fan base. Mm -hmm. It was sexy. That rhythm, you can't. Come on. How could you not dance over that? How could you not dance over that? And, but it was still aggressive and hardcore enough for the fellas to be like, to make that funk face. Damn, that's just sick. <laughs> like that's, Amazing. So, and, so long story short, I told him, I sent him the track, and he flipped. He said, nephew, yes, I want to record. Da -da 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 -da. I said, okay, under one condition. He said, anything for you, nephew. Can we get Uncle Monty Moore on here? Because Monty Moore, one of the baddest songwriting keyboard players in the history, and the only white guy in the time. So that if that mm -hmm. don't tell you nothing else about who Monty is, he ain't your typical white guy. This guy, funk, classical, the whole bit, whatever, the, whatever you want to call it. And again, our relationship spans over twenty something years. So now here I am. I got Jelly Bean, Monty Moore, and then last but not least, the final piece of the puzzle. My big brother, the great Tony M of New Power Generation. I've always loved the way Tony rhymes. Because you know, my, my, my rap style is kind of rapid fire aggressive. And him and Moni Love and, and um, my, my other um, icon, Jazz O, the one who pretty much put Jay-Z on the map. Those are my guys. Like That fast style of rapping is part of the lineage that I'm part of. Mm. So putting Tony on it made it complete. And the rest is history. It became one of the more... If not, I think it's the most popular song on Jelly Bean's first album. And just people love it. Every time we do a live, people go crazy. People can't help but get up and dance and stuff like that. So I'm proud to say that I have a classic record with my Minneapolis heroes. It, oh, no, my nothing gosh. Beats that. Nothing beats that. Oh, that's so amazing. I love that Minneapolis sound. I used to live in the Chicago where we get all that, too. Oh, so my you God, know, that's amazing. That's, Midwest, that's the Midwest. The that's Midwest, amazing. baby. You know. That's right. We all know, it too. And uh, you also have a new song out, too, as well. I'm not sure we hit upon it. Uh, America's Inception. And uh, tell us yes. about that. Looking forward to it. OK, well, um, America's Inception is the first single off of my highly anticipated, because everybody's been waiting on it, mm -hmm. um, and also probably going to be my most scariest album. Why? 
because this is my political social album. And mm. because I am unapologetically black, without question, and a lot of people who are not of that, if, unless they know history and unless they know what we're talking about, I say scary because I'm speaking a lot of hardcore truth because after I release this album, I'm not making any more political statements on social media because the thing is I'm learning that they're starting to try to crack down. As soon as you mention a Trump name or anybody else, they, they try to get in on you. Like I'm like, you know what? You're not going to take away my freedom to post what I post. You know what? You can't stop my music. So at that particular point, anybody that has any questions about my beliefs or what I feel about the state of this country, it's going to all be on this album. So America's Inception is the first single where I basically talk about when people, you know, people don't even understand. And it's, and it's baffling to me that so many people, and I'm going to say a lot, a lot of white people as well. They're very clueless to how racism was started. Mm-hmm. And they don't want to, they, and they don't want to accept that particular part of American history. They always want to celebrate and wave the flag high up in the air. But in the words of previous Clearwater Revival, I ain't no fortunate son. So for me, it's like, you know, if you understood the history and why this country was built, I always tell people, of course I love America, but I hate what it was, but I but I will, I will forever hate what it was built on. We're not mm-hmm. going to ignore that. We're not going to ignore what it was built on. And then you got people on the opposing side telling me, oh, but that's the past. We should, we should, we should, that's just the past. I said the same way y'all remember 9-11. So if you remember 9-11, then let me remember that my ancestors were scarred and enslaved and killed and raped. In this country, this is America's inception. The birth of America starts with that. That's why the first two lines in, on the song is once upon a time in America, they had a ship over from Africa. The infrastructure of our government was owned by slave owning presidents. That's mm-hmm. the truth. That, that's not an opinion. That is the whole, that's the hardcore truth that nobody really wants to hear. So I said, I'm going to put it in a song and we're going to have some. Beatles, Beach Boys, Sly and the Family Stone influences in there as well. And then there's a, there's a little bit of Prince in there too. But um, I'm saying that more so because I feel like if you're going to talk about a heavy message, musically, you want it to be good. So, of course, I started thinking about Marvin Gaye's What's Going On album, which is the greatest album of all time, in my opinion. Um, still, relevant, yeah. 50, still relevant 50 years later. Um, Public Enemies, It Takes a Nation of Nations and Millions to Hold Us Back, and Fear of a Black Planet. Sly and the Family Stone, there's a riot going on. I took the influences musically of those records and helped to create this album. But America's Inception is the lead off single where I basically talk about, um, you know, how this country was created. That's why the chorus is run, baby, run for your protection. That's the way it's been since America's Inception. Well, y'all got it. Matter of fact, the um, the parentheses, it says do your research because I got to a point where I got tired of certain people hitting me up. Now, mind you, people that don't know, I'll, I'll give the information now. But. A lot of people are still willing and sitting here listening to politicians and listening to everybody's story, not doing the research for themselves. As a matter of fact, um, one of the songs on the album is called Politicians Are Not God. That's a mm. real, yeah, yeah. And that's a real heavy one. I think everybody, again, if you're politically inclined and you're supremely intelligent, you get it, white or black. If you don't get it and you're still stuck in this whole thing of America, the beauty. Right, of yeah. Uh-huh. If, you're still, if you're still stuck in that paragraph, then I'm going to be honest with you. This album and this song is not for you. <laughs> Period. Okay. You know, something, too, you touch upon the Beatles when it comes to that um, with America's Inception as well, too. I have a really interesting story about that. When they first came to America, they were horrified with the whole situation, what was going on. And they said, too, that if you don't put the the races all together instead of these sections, they'll just cancel the show. And I thought that was a strong statement right there. Well, because everybody wants the Beatles. Yeah, because because, well, I mean, first and foremost, I mean, the Beatles, without question, is the most influential um, rock group in, in the history of rock music. And just, of course, a heavy influence on me, you know, thanks to my my grandfather, who actually, um, here's a funny thing, the Beatles were Joey D and the Starlighters opening act when they were in, in London. So, yeah, I met, Paul McC- <laughs> I met Paul McCartney, what was it, a few years ago? I had a chance to tell Paul McCartney, so, you know, my granddad, Sam Taylor, was in the was in Joey D and Starlight. He said, oh, my God, we opened up for them. So he remembered. I'm like, wow. Wow. Yeah, he remembers. He's like, he said, yes, they were so nice to us. I said, yeah, he said, because in my grandfather's book, he talks about it. He talks about it. He said, they, they were such nice guys. And a year later, they came to America and just pretty much wiped most of us guys 
not out of existence, but more so just like they just took over the whole landscape. So um, the Beatles, without question, heavy influence on my music, without without a doubt. And you got to remember who their heroes are. You know, John and Paul always says, Chuck Berry and Little Richard. The same way how the Rolling Stones were also in my mind. I love the Rolling Stones. I'm a diehard Rolling Stones fanatic. And Muddy Waters, came, yes. They came to Chicago because they wanted to meet Howlin' Wolf. He mm-hmm. was like, he was basically like, they, they's like, no, we came to, 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 to lay at the feet of Howlin' Wolf. That's how much reverence and respect they have for Black culture. That one clip of Brian Jones where he's literally introducing them and he's like, you know, I'm just, I'm just gonna shut up right now. I'm just gonna shut up and let him play. That's, <laughs> that's reverence. That's reverence, and that's because these these white boys from London, the Who too, the Who's like that as well. Like they they knew where they knew where it came from. That's why I have a special place in my heart for all of the British groups of the '60s because they all bowed down to the black kings of R and B music. Because without R and B, there would be no rock and roll, as Little Richard would say. Rhythm and blues had a baby, and they called it rock and roll. I conceived it, achieved it, believed it. You know, you know, you know, you know how you put this wrong. I'm the originator. I'm the emancipator because he was. <laughs> he wasn't exaggerating. The only other person that claims victim to that, that that claims that title, would be Chuck Berry. That should be respectfully. Elvis didn't call himself the king. He didn't. The pe- the, the 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 white racist regime called him that because if anybody knows history. Elvis would even tell you himself that he wasn't the king of rock and roll. He knew he wasn't the king. He would say it mm-hmm. himself. He, and a matter of fact, in the interview, he actually said it. See, a lot of people don't know this information. In the interview, he said it. I'm not the king of rock and roll. These people call me. I'm, I'm not. He said, if that's the case, then if anybody's the king of rock and roll, it's fast domino. That's his words. Mm. That's, really, that's really interesting, too. It made me think of our Colonel Tom Parker giving him, like, the title of the king, running his career and everything else, you know. Yeah. That's a main thing of it. And I'm just glad he had a really good perspective as well, too. We're here with the amazing LAW here on the Mike Wagner Show, part of the Twi- Pan 12 Project. And, um, you know, before you, um, you know, I just realized something. You also have a new podcast out called the Plant 12 Podcast. You had uh, Vanessa Williams, Brenda K. Starr, and uh, Trevor yeah. Hanek of Old Town. And um, you also got uh, the Plant 12 Movement and um, everything else, seven Grammy uh, nominee as well, too. The Planet 12. We can't forget to talk about that, including the upcoming tour on the podcast and more. Can't forget it. Of course, man. But, you know, the Planet 12 Podcast is my baby. It started during the pandemic because like all of the other artists who tour and do shows on a, on a weekly basis, my shows got canceled. I mean, I only, I only had two. There were two that weren't canceled. But um, and we had to, that was, and I was in the heavy thick of the pandemic where we had to be damn near surround wrapped just to walk up in the building. But um, Oh, my gosh. Um, so my fans have always said over the last 15 years that I've been cultivating my fan base, they've always said, Lord. You even need your own radio show, or your podcast, because, you know, the, the, the musical knowledge and the stories that you tell about the people you worked with and the uncut, uncensored way that you tell them in your dark Brooklyn humor. We want to hear some of that. And I fought against it for years, not fought against it like I wasn't going to do. I said, well, I have to have time to do it because, you know, you know, to run a podcast, you have to be still for a minute. You can't really. I mean, unless you record all your episodes in one day and then you air them, of course. But. I really wasn't in that mindset at that point. So here I am in my house, my big ass house, and (laughs) it hits me. You know what, Law? I think it's time to do the podcast. I think you should bring some of your industry friends on and then, of course, bring up your heroes. Because I wasn't just going to bring anybody on my podcast. I mean, of course, we're going to highlight some 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 new artistry and, and a lot of indie artists who I think that are incredible. And it's only people who I like because I don't, you know, turn people I'm into, certain people I'm not. But the majority of the interviews that I do was going to be my heroes and people who I looked up to. So Brenda K. Starr, Vanessa Williams, who's a huge influence on me as a singer. Um, of course, Big Daddy Kane, Lisa Lisa, Brenda K. Starr. Um, 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 there's so many people I had on the show. Cece Peniston, um, Kenny Lattimore, who I just did a show with on Sunday in Harlem with Ray Chu. You know, it's so many people who I've had on there that are my heroes. Um, Jane, Jane Wheatland of the Go-Go's. You know, oh, she's amazing. He thought she's a sweetheart. I've known Jane for over 20 something years. Like, those, those are my girls. Her, her, her and Belinda were my first white girl crushes. So that's a, that's an even personal thing for me having them on there. But um, yeah, so I, I've had pretty much a lot of my heroes on there. Um, we're working on the second season now because I'm, you know, of course, once things got back to normal, I had to go out there and eat and, and do what I do. But now that we got other people coming back 
to the show. We're going to have some recurring guests. We're also going to have some other people on there as well, incredible indie artists who I think are dope. So that's the great part about the podcast. And I work at my own pace because, you know, the fans understand it. Because fact, a couple of fans asked me a couple of days ago. They were like, um, hey, Lord, you still doing my I said, yeah, there's a whole lot coming, man. We, we ain't done with that. I said, it ain't over. We sparked the movie. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of my fan base got to know me about my music more so through social media than anything else because of the podcast. A lot of them didn't even know I was an artist until they saw certain clips. And then they hear me talk about who I work with because they were comparing notes with the other artists. And some of the same people who I look up to work with the people who I look up to. So it's the same thing. That is rather interesting. And of course, you'll be going on tour pretty soon as well, too, um, with, with your Plant 12 movement as well. So, you know, that's part of it. So you got a lot going on there, Lost. So you got to say that you got a lot going on, especially with a Plant 12 tour. It's like, you know, what else is there? <laughs> um, just conquering the world at my own pace. When you are when you are a boss, and you know this because you're a boss of your, your podcast, when you are an owner, it hits different. because. Success comes in increments, but because of people being so accustomed to watching television, a lot of fans have this, not my fans, they're very educated about my career at this point, but a lot of fans of certain artists, they have this jaded view of the music industry. They think that once you're on television, all that glitters is gold, and it really isn't. A lot of times you don't understand that some of these artists don't own their stuff. They're being told what to do 90% of the time. And then even if they are somewhat owners, they still have to shuck and jive for certain platforms. Mm -hmm. So my career and the way I have it structured, the way I have it set up, because I have, a, that's why I always say I have a platinum resume. Because you, I mean, you you read half of the list, but that list grows bigger every day with each thing that I, that comes across my office. So for me to be able to step forward and they'd be like, well, why should we pay you this amount of money? I said, because I work with all the major artists you had on the stage. It's part of my lineage. You know what I mean? And not to mention just my history with Amy alone gets me that because I'm pretty sure you're going to want me to talk about some of that stuff, but you're not going to get me into a, a box and be like, okay, well, we're going to do you this and we're going to give you scraps. I'm like, no, this is, you're going you're to pay. This is, this is, this is still a business. And the thing is that I structured myself that way to make people understand that don't be, and I've been on television, you know, I've been on television. So that's how you know I'm talking the truth. I've been on TV. So that's nice. And yeah, there are checks for that, but that's not the end all, the be all. People have to understand that it's more substantial of what you're doing to keep your brand going. And mm. I've, been a, I've been a master at that. And I'm still master. Just so be clear. Master doesn't mean that I, I can't learn nothing else. I learn something new every day about my brand, different ways to market it, different ways to put it out there. And that's because I'm still willing. I'm still open minded. I, I remain teachable even in my mastery. So at the end of the day, that's what it's about. So it's, it's a blessing, you know, to be able to work at my own pace to where a lot of people, like even during the pandemic, and it's not to brag or anything like that, it's just to in, influence somebody or inspire somebody. Pandemic, after we did that, I did something else that my um, that my fans had asked me to do. I waited 15 years to finally put out merch, and it flew off the shelves. It flew. Ooh, how do you like that? <laughs> 15 years, and above it, but again, People said, what took you so long? First of all, time is everything. God's timing, especially more than ours. And then number yes, two, definitely. Mm -hmm. number, and then number two, you got to remember, just like podcasts, merch is a quality business. I could have went to a, I could have went to a cheap ass factory in Brooklyn and just put some stuff on it and say, Hey guys, buy my shirt. No, my music is quality. So if my fans are going to wear my shirts and, and, and and my hats and my alien gear, I had to make sure the gear was quality. And I did. And that's the reason why. And then the feedback, I mean, if you look on my page, if the fans have been wearing my stuff, they say all the time, it's like, oh, this shirt feels good on me. I said, that's the important part. It can look good, but if it don't feel good, or if the, if the stitch ain't right, or if the quality of the, the material ain't right, I take all that seriously. I ain't mm -hmm. going to put no merch out there and have people paying 15 to 40 bucks for a hoodie and, and the hoodie got all this other shrubbery underneath and it makes you itch. Like, I, I'm not going to do that. I want to make sure that my fans are getting quality from me at every angle. So there's mm -hmm. a blessing in that, you know? And, and certainly doing a great job as well, too. And uh, feel free to check mine out and we'll check yours out and everybody check it out. Here's no, the amazing absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. 
speaking of merchandise, you have uh, one of them on you as well, too, like uh, like a hoodie or T-shirt, a hat or anything like that. It's like, I like to see some of your merch, or we all do. Yeah, we have, a matter of fact, let me see if I have this up here. This, y'all getting all these exclusive. Y'all. <laughs> 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 uh, Oh, certainly amazing, too. So, yeah. <laughs> We're here with the amazing uh, LAW here on the Mike Wagner Show. And, of course, uh, in a few minutes, we'll be talking about um, what's come up in um, his career as well, too. Oh, looks like we uh, got one of the merch. Oh, yep. my gosh. Wow. So we still got the black and white shirts left, my logo. And on the back of it, of course, my moniker that I'm known for. They call me the most talented kid in the music biz. It's a play off the James Brown era where a lot of the artists, like Kim and Jackie Wilson, have their own monikers. like Matt. Jackie Wilson was Mr. Excitement. You know, um, Ray Charles is the genius of soul. James Brown had a, about eight different aliases. So um, most talented the kid in the music biz was the one that we self-created to kind of help move the movement of what we were doing. And then also we got the purple, but we have very limited edition of these. These are the ones that sold the fastest. We have the purple shirts left, only available in the large. And on the back of this one is one of my popular slogans, which is support or shut up. Now how that now how that slogan was created was because all I kept seeing was music lovers saying, bring the real music back. Bring the real music back. It never left. <laughs> real music is still here. There's still there's a lot of great new uh, forget me. Forget me. There's a lot of other great artists doing great things in music, but we gotta support them. Mm-hmm. No, my, my my big my Grammy Award winning big sis, the great Layla Hathaway, daughter of Donnie Hathaway. She's been putting out consistent bangers for the last 20-something years, and she's just now getting her flowers through awards. We're like, oh, you you didn't do it later. I said, I've been a fan of that woman since 1990 before we even knew each other. So keep in mind, (laughs) you know what I'm saying? Look, I was here first. I'm one of the first ones. And not not because her father's Donnie. I was into her. Then Mm -hmm. we got all that. The fact that your father's one of my biggest heroes. But the thing is, is that we got to support. We have to support our people. We have to support our music, our creatives. If we don't support, don't just be on the internet talking. If I put out an album, buy it. If you're a fan of mine, you should have all my stuff. That's the way I look at it. If you, are, if you claim to be a law fan, you should have everything I put out. If you claim to be a law fan, you should have every T-shirt and anything that you can get your hands on. That's mm-hmm. the way I see it. Anybody telling me that they're a fan of my work, but they've never been to a show, but they've never bought merch and they didn't even pay 99 cents for a single, which is out right now, my American Deception single. I'm sorry, but in my opinion, you're not a fan. Mm-hmm. So support Just- or shut up. That's my whole thing. Don't, don't you, no, cause that, here's the thing, because everybody starts complaining about, well, how come Law, we didn't see Law at the such and such. How come, how come he's not mentioned among all the other great art with all that he's done? I said, well, first of all, it depends on the perspective that you look at it from. But number two, what are you doing to keep me and my name and my brand in people's mouths? What are mm-hmm. you doing? That's what you know, I'm yeah. like. What, 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 what do you do? Are you doing your part? Are you just sitting on here being Twitter fingers? Now, see, this is me practicing what I preach because guess what? Anybody that knows me, I promote more artists on my social medias more times than I do myself. So what does that tell you about me? I don't now mind you, Lay- Layla is like my big sister. I could easily get a free CD from her if I just say, hey, can, here's my address. But I buy, I purchase, I buy her stuff. I buy, like all my heroes, I buy all their stuff. Mm-hmm. As soon as they come out, iTunes, press the button. I don't even wait. Press the button. There you go, yeah. <laughs> I don't wait. I buy anyway. Even if they do give it to me for free or they don't, I don't, I buy a ticket. Now mind you, some shows I get it for free, but guess what? New edition. I was with them the whole, this like the last five shows they did on this culture tour. I paid for one of my tickets because I wanted to get a front row seat. There I you had go. A backstage pass, had a backstage pass and everything, but I paid for a ticket, $250-something. Because those are my idols. They're worth it. So even in me getting backstage and watching them and, and being close with the members for over 20-something years, I still support them. And And that's certainly amazing as well, too. And where can we find all your... Uh find all your works where can we find you how do people contact you or can get more information about your um your, your latest single you're also podcast and everything where can we find you and get all your latest work at okay well here's the rundown instagram at planet 12 law twitter at planet 12 law facebook facebook.com slash law planet 12 
I'm also on SoundCloud, which is can, find, can, can be found underneath Planet Talk Productions or L asterisk A asterisk W. They can find all the music on there. And of course, all of my music is available on iTunes, Spotify, Tidal, you name it. All the um all the digital stores. You can find it on there. Just, just make sure you type in L asterisk A asterisk W or Planet 12. All three of my albums, the Planet 12 Syndrome, the Planet 12 Live Sessions, and Mega Maniac, and also my new single is out right now, America's Inception. You can find that on all digital albums. That is certainly amazing. We will check it out. Where are the amazing uh LAW featuring Planet 12 here on the Mike Wagner Show. A very big thank you for your time and definitely looking forward to having it in soon. And uh, just thank lastly, so we went over the, all the influences and everything else. What is the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? Oh, okay. Well, I'll break it down in three sections. Um, learn the business. 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 Once you learn the business, it makes it easy for you to get comfortable in your craft. The reason why I'm comfortable in my craft is because I own my stuff. When you own your stuff and you have no, nobody's over you telling you when to put out a record or when you can do this and you got a fan base that truly rocks with you, you really can't lose. So even when the bigger things do come, because you see a lot of great things have been happening for us just this year alone. And who's this? You know, next year is going to be even bigger because I, I remain optimistic because I'm in control. If I had the same story that most of my heroes had, I probably wouldn't be sitting here in front of you. Mm -hmm. It'd probably be just me um, having that. And mind you, those stories are very helpful, too, for people that people don't want to know about the industry. They are helpful, but it still breaks my heart. My grandfather being one of them, because my grandfather, um, DMX, first big hit, Get At Me, Dog, um, samples my grandfather's guitar. Lit. Now, thank God that my grandfather still gets royalties off of that for the estate that we own, but... If, if his grandsons didn't step in with the lawyers to make sure that the money was coming to the right place, my grandfather would have really died in obscurity. So the, the fact that people know who he is now and people have been getting accustomed to learning more about my grandfather's history, but that's because we fought to make sure. Thank God for social media. Thank God that we have ownership. Thank God that we kept his name in perspective. So I say to any artist or anybody, and not just music either, even if it's fashion, um, entertainment, any form of acting, if it's clothing lines, be the proprietor, the creator, and the owner of your own intellectual property. White, black, straight, gay, I don't care. Be your owner. Don't just be willing to jump and get a record deal for the sake of getting a record deal because you feel it'll help you advance in your career. Times have changed. And I'm not saying nothing bad against record labels because there are some record labels that actually do good, that do good work. But it makes me wonder what kind of contract does the artist have? You understand what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. you're, just better off, you're just better off being an owner. I don't see anything bad because record labels can be shiesty too, but indie, indie record labels are shiesty too. Ain't just major record labels. Indie labels are something else too. So I just said, you know what? I own Planet Soul. I just put out music my way. And when things hit, things hit because I could be able to sit back and be like, I own it. So for me, and the fans feel good too. The fans feel good knowing that they can, when they when they purchase my music, they know that I'm, I'm being supported. They know that financially, there's no crooks in my midst trying to steal my money. You know what I'm saying? I'm saying that's the mm -hmm. best feeling when you support an artist that you like and you know that the money is going directly to them and not a crooked manager or or or, or, or a bad A and R or or somebody that had nothing to do with the record. Because these are stories I can talk about all day, you know? So um, so learn the business and stay on top of your craft and stay healthy. Because if you don't stay healthy in this craft, how are you going to be able to enjoy your success once it comes and eat the fruits of your labor? You don't want to be sickly and out of shape or don't know what you're doing or to have that because that's what the industry wants you to do. The industry wants you to get sick and get all big and you can't do nothing or be too malnourished and stuff like that. And next thing you know, you try to come out with a record and people ain't really liking the way you look or different things like that. So stay healthy because it's a, it's a setup. Stay healthy. Doesn't mean you have to, you don't have to be a vegan to be healthy. Just be be healthy mentally and spiritually first because that's going to play a part in your, in your physical. So. Mm. And that's a very good point. I really like that. I'm taking it all in. Once again, we're at the amazing LAW Power of Planet 12 here on the Mike Wagner Show. A very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Learned a lot. <laughs> Looking forward to having you again soon. Make sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. And once again, tell us about your upcoming projects. What's your website? How do people contact? Where can people purchase? Check out your works and uh, check out your podcast and everything else. Yes, um, website currently being worked on, as absolutely with everything else. Um, 
We have two amazing shows coming up. Um, October 5th is going to be a very special show because I have two very special guests who I'm not announcing yet. So all the fans who will probably be seeing this by the time this comes out, they'll they'll know the, the perspective of, of who the guests are going to be. And then we have a big show coming up on August 26th um, at the Legendary Bitter Inn. The Bitter Inn is very special to us because I am the first hip hop based artists to play the bitter ring. Up until up until we came along, they did not have hip hop in the building. They had every they had all my heroes. They have Bruce Springsteen, um, um of course the Ozzy brothers, Curtis Mayfield, they've all played the bitter ring, but they didn't have a hip hop based act of my caliber until we came in. So y'all in for a real show. Plus we're doing a special tribute to Michael Jackson because his birthday's two days later after that show. So that's coming up. And then um I have about five different album projects I'm working on right now to be honest with you. I have um all of my own. I have a jazz fusion hip hop project getting ready to come out with um John Patitucci, the great John Patitucci. <laughs> um, so it's some stuff. We got a lot of stuff in the works. All you have to do is just stay tuned to all my social medias because um um Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Just stay stay locked in. You stay locked in. You'll get all the information there. We certainly do so. Once again, LAW, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. You've been a great law as well, too. Looking forward to having you again soon. Thank Make you. sure you keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Live, have you back. We wish you all the best. You definitely, definitely have a great future. Have you. Keep it up. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, man. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios. Take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley, and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter, and it's very well done. I'm gonna highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia. He is the author of Missing. And I want to give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamotionzea.com. Missing. Available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show. Brought to you by international award-winning author Mia Mosin-Zia of Missing. And powered by Sonic Web Studios. Be sure to join us again on over 40 podcast platforms. And of course, on the MikeWagnerShow.com, HamiltonRadio.net, and Diamonds FM. Don't forget to support our program with a generous donation at the MikeWagnerShow.com. Thanks for listening.